Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 73. Now, it's about World War I then, what was happening 100 years ago this week, and it's also about World War I now. News and updates about the centennial and the commemoration. This week, Mike Schuster and Dr. Edward Lengel fill us in on the action at Cantini. Patricia O'Toole tells us about her book, The Moralist, Woodrow Wilson and the World He Made. Michael Hitt updates us on the great state of Georgia in the war. Dr. Jason Krauthammel shares his expertise on PTSD, trauma, and World War I. Catherine Akey with the commemoration of World War I in social media. All on World War I Centennial News, a weekly podcast brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. Although we know that the fighting in World War I is going to end this coming November, a hundred years ago this week, the world didn't. The United States continues on its war effort, changing industry, society, and nearly every aspect of life in the country. This includes continuing to draft young men into the military service. Now, with that in mind, let's jump into our centennial time machine and go back a hundred years to see what's leading in the news this week, a hundred years ago, in the war that changed the world. From the pages of the official bulletin, the government's War Gazette, published by George Creel and the Committee on Public Information, our government's propaganda ministry. This week, the headlines are full of renewed vigor for pushing the war effort forward. Now, I want to stop for just a minute and give you a note about something we haven't talked about for a number of weeks. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission is republishing this amazing primary source of information on what the U.S. government was thinking, saying, and promoting a hundred years ago. We republish a new issue every day on the centennial of its original publication date. So, if you want to read the government's daily newspaper, except Sunday... Go to www.cc.org slash bulletin and you can follow the war effort in a wholly unique and really interesting way. Dateline, Tuesday, May 21, 1918. Today, the headline of the official bulletin reads... President in opening Red Cross campaign calls German peace approaches insincere. No limit on size of army going to France. In the story, President Woodrow Wilson says, quote, There are two duties with which we are face to face. The first duty is to win the war. And the second duty that goes hand in hand with it is to win it greatly and worthily, showing the real quality of not only our power, but the real quality of our purpose and of ourselves. Of course, the first duty, the duty that we must keep in the foreground of all of our thoughts until it is accomplished, is to win the war. I have heard gentlemen recently say that we must get five million men ready. I ask, why limited to five million? He continues with, we are not diverted from the grim purpose of winning the war by any insincere approaches upon the subject of peace. I can say with a clear conscience that I have tested those imitations and have found them insincere. The president goes on to describe the full commitment and focus of the nation to carry out our mission. All this prefaces a proclamation the president will make on the very next day, setting up a new call to arms of young men who've turned 21 in the past year and to all men who are not engaged directly in the war effort, as you're about to hear. Dateline, Tuesday, May 21, 1918. And the headline reads, 
President's proclamation fixing June 5 as the date for registering young men who have reached the age of 21 during the past year. Only persons exempt are officers and enlisted men in naval and military service. The proclamation includes, It is resolved that during the present emergency, all male persons, citizens of the United States, and all male persons residing in the United States who have, since the fifth day of June 1917, attained the age of 21, they shall be subject to registration in accordance with the regulations to be prescribed by the President. It shall be the duty of all such persons to present themselves for and submit to registration under the provisions of the set act approved May 18, 1917. Now, the guy in charge of pulling off this new draft registration is the Provost Marshal, a General Enoch Herbert Crowder from Missouri. He seems determined not to let anything slip by, as the next article illustrates. Dateline, Thursday, May 23, 1918. A headline in the New York Times reads, Work or Fight, Warning to All on Draft Rolls. General Crowder issued sweeping order aiming at idlers and those in non-useful pursuits. Goes into effect July 1. Includes gamblers, waiters, service, store clerks, elevator men, and those with no occupation. May be blow to baseball. In the article it reads, Idlers, unemployed, and those of draft age not engaged in a central or useful employment will be rounded up for military service unless they apply themselves at a sort of labor that will dovetail into the plans of the administration for winning the war. All such youths of draft age will either have to serve in the army or work. Now, there's some resistance to the draft around the nation, but for the most part, the young men of America join up and loyally help the war effort in the best way that they can. And they're put on notice a hundred years ago this week in the war that changed the world. See the May 20 to May 24 issues of the official bulletin at www.cc.org slash bulletin and also see the other links that we've put in the podcast notes from the New York Times. Also 100 years ago this week, the war in the sky takes a turn for America, now, not on the battlefields of Europe, but in the halls of administration back home. Dateline, May 20, 1918. A headline in the New York Times reads, Wilson recasts aviation service, takes all control of operations and production away from Signal Corps. President acts under the Overman Law to bring about improvements in the situation. And the story reads, President Wilson today took what he regards as definitive action towards the improvement of the Army aircraft program when he issued a presidential order stripping the Chief Signal Corps Officer of the Army, Major General George O. Squire, of every function pertaining to aircraft and aviation. The functions were transferred to two new offices. First, the Bureau of Military Aeronautics and the Bureau of Aircraft Production, created directly under the Secretary of War. The Signal Corps, said Secretary Baker this afternoon, will now have only to do with signals and nothing to do with any phase of the production or use of aircraft. The order gives Brigadier General William Kenley all of the property pertaining to the use of aircraft and all money in connection therewith. Now, this development essentially creates the U.S. Army Air Corps. Our regular listeners may remember from our March 9 episode number 62 how the U.S. Signal Corps is one of the real technology innovators, and they were also the military's founding pioneer in the use of aircraft. Here's a clip from episode 62. By the turn of the century, the U.S. Army Signal Corps had taken on a leadership role, not just with visual signaling, but also with the telegraph, telephone, cable communications, meteorology, combat photography, and had even sprouted an aeronautical and aviation section. 
Nearly a decade before American forces engaged the enemy in Europe, the Wright brothers made test flights of the Army's first airplane built to the Signal Corps specifications. Army aviation stayed with the Signal Corps until May of 1918, when the aviation section of the Signal Corps is transformed by President Wilson's executive order into the Army Air Service, the forerunner of the United States Air Force. Well, that moment in May of 1918 is right now. Driven partially by the previous scandals about the effectiveness of U.S. investment in its airplane development, production, and training, and partially by the fact that the aircraft, once seen primarily as a reconnaissance device, is taking on a strategic offensive warcraft role. Now put under the U.S. Army Air Service and later to become the U.S. Air Force. A transition that takes a major turn this week, a hundred years ago in the War in the Sky. See the podcast notes for a simplified 50-year timeline showing how the use of aircraft evolved from 1907 to September 1947 when the U.S. Air Force is established as a separate branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. This week, a hundred years ago, in the war on the Western Front, the American forces attack for the first time at Cantini. Both Mike Schuster and Ed Lengel tell us the story of the battle a first test of American metal. But they each explore the event using different sources. So this week, we're going to blend together the Great War Project with Mike Schuster and America Emerges with Dr. Edward Langle into a single story about the Battle of Cantini. By the end of May a century ago, there are hundreds of thousands of American troops in France on the Western Front, but they are deployed in relatively safe trenches, largely away from the serious fighting. The French decide to give them a chance to do something more than occupy quiet trenches, writes historian Thomas Fleming. They selected as a target the village of Cantigny, situated on a ridge some 55 miles northwest of Paris. In a smaller operation, the Germans already mauled the American troops in a trench raid near Verdun, prompting British Prime Minister David Lloyd George to comment snidely, this was the sort of thing that would happen again and again if the amateur Americans were allowed to form their own army. 100 years ago this week, American and French forces assaulted the little German-held village of Cantini. Tactically, the place had no value, but it meant the world to the U.S. Army. Up to now, American forces had never fought a major military action in Europe. So far in World War I, they'd sat entirely on the defensive. Now, though, General John J. Blackjack Pershing was determined to show the world that the United States had arrived forcefully on the world stage. Lieutenant Colonel George C. Marshall planned the attack for troops of the 1st Division's 28th Infantry Regiment. Three American battalions would attack side by side, supported by French artillery. The center battalion would be accompanied by lumbering French Schneider tanks and engineers with flamethrowers and satchel charges. It was a simple, direct assault plan. The problem was that it took no account of the German-occupied high ground, Hill 104, overlooking Cantini. After the Americans occupied the village, they'd be under direct enemy observation and could expect bombardment. That wasn't Marshall's fault. Higher planners deemed the effort to take the hill to be beyond American and French resources. A sudden and overwhelming gas bombardment hit 1st Division lines two days before the planned attack. One company of the 28th Regiment nearly broke and fled. Then, on May 27th, German infantry launched strong raids against the Doughboys just south and north of Cantini. A German officer told his men not to worry. They were only facing Americans. But the Doughboys beat them back. Fortunately, the few American prisoners who were captured kept their mouths shut about the attack planned for the following day. American Private Dan Edwards described the artillery bombardment that opened the assault on May 28th. Cantini just began to boil up, he said and it kept on boiling. In a short time, we couldn't see it at all. We couldn't see the ground anywhere. The air was full of trees, stones, timber, equipment, bodies, everything you can imagine, all smashed up and whirling around with the dirt. The shells kept right on going overhead in one steady screeching yell without a let up. Reports the story in Fleming in the early morning hours of May 28th, a century ago, French and American artillery hurled hundreds of shells into Cantigny smashing its ruins to total rubble. Then, reports Fleming, the Doughboys advanced behind a rolling barrage and sheets of machine gun. They found other American troops dazed and demoralized by the bombardment. 
Nevertheless, the Germans withdraw. The next morning, writes Fleming, the French trumpeted this tiny victory in their newspapers and the headlines echoed around the world. Then with no explanation, the French heavy weapons disappear. The French redeploy their heavy guns to defend against a German attack 40 miles southeast of Cantigny. The French needed every soldier and weapon they could find to stop it, Fleming writes. The Americans were left on their own to cope with German counterattacks to regain Cantigny. They are simply outgunned. Within 24 hours, a third of the defending American force was dead or wounded. The commanding American officer reports his front line was pounded to hell and gone. His men had to be relieved in 24 hours, he reported, or he would not be responsible for what happened next. Visible signs of imminent breakdown were everywhere. One American lieutenant went berserk, Fleming reports, and started shooting at his own troops. German artillery immediately punished the Doughboys by firing a high-explosive bombardment that would last for two days nonstop. Next, German infantry attacked Cantini from three directions. The American commander and his men were brave, but green, and struggled to hold on. The enemy nearly broke through, and attacks had continued until May 29th. The Americans held by their fingernails, but they held. Overall, the Germans suffered 1,600 casualties against just over 1,000 Americans. But although the Germans captured Cantini, doctors would, for the first time, diagnose cases of doughboys with severe shell shock. The Americans had taken Cantigny. Some see it as a high price to pay for an unknown village of relatively little value. But Cantigny was not about winning the war. It was about proving that Americans could handle combat on the Western Front. Mike Schuster is a former NPR correspondent and curator for the Great War Project blog. And Dr. Edward Lengel is an American military historian, author, and our segment host for America Emerges, Military Stories from World War I. There are links in the podcast notes to both their sites. Oh, and also, we've put a series of links in the podcast notes from the New York Times all about the updates from the fighting front. This week on the Great War Channel on YouTube, they released a wonderful bio episode on the U.S. Marine Corps' legendary Dan Daly, the recipient of two Medals of Honor and probably deserving of more. The episode is called The Fightinest Marine, Dan Daly. A young man that had just enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps, when told who his first sergeant was, said, God, do you mean he's real? I thought he was someone the Marines made up, like Paul Bunyan. His sergeant was very much real, and his name was Dan Daly. To see the whole clip, search for The Great War on YouTube, or follow the link in the podcast notes. And that's the news from 100 years ago this week. Now, let's fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. As many of you know, this part of the podcast focuses on now and how we're commemorating the centennial of World War I. This week in Commission News, we want to highlight a special Memorial Day centennial event happening in New York City. It's the 369th Experience, three musical performances depicting the African-American and Puerto Rican experience in World War I through the eyes and the ears of the 369th U.S. Infantry Regimental Band. Named by their German enemies is the Hellfighters. The Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th Regiment, was formed out of the volunteer 15th New York National Guard. While they were over there, they fought heroically and ferociously in the trenches of France under French command through some of the most brutal combat and some of the most important battles of the entire war. Their story is a powerful one as they faced staunch racism during their training, in a segregated military, and very sadly, after their exemplary performance as American soldiers on their return home from the war. The 369th famously had as a part of their unit a regimental military band, made up of some of the most influential and talented musicians of their day. The military band became legendary for their unique sound and their warm reception by the people of the war-torn regions over there. 
Under the care of band leader Major James Reese Europe, they introduced French listeners to American jazz and are said to have ushered in the jazz age in Europe. Carrying on their legacy, the 369th Experience pulls together talented modern-day musicians from colleges around the country. They competed to participate in a 369th tribute band, which will perform and highlight the original band's music this Memorial Day weekend. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission is proud to sponsor the performances by the 369th Experience at the USS Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum Complex in New York. The concerts are free and are sure to be awesome. If you're in the Big Apple this Memorial Day weekend, perhaps attending Fleet Week, Performances are scheduled for Sunday, May 27th at 1 p.m. and on Monday at 1.30 and 3.30 p.m. at the USS Intrepid. There are reference links for you in the podcast notes, and we're going to be doing a follow-up story next week to tell you how it went. For this week's Spotlight on the Media, we're turning our attention back onto the President of the United States during World War I, Woodrow Wilson. We're joined by Professor Patricia O'Toole, a biographer and professor emerita in the School of the Arts at Columbia University and author of three acclaimed biographies, including her new book, The Moralist, Woodrow Wilson and the World He Made. Patricia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Uh, Patricia, let's start with an overview question. Woodrow Wilson doesn't always show up in the list of most important presidents in the U.S. Do you think he was and why? He is quite a different character from most other presidents. He's very shy. He would rather be in his studies thinking through a problem on his own. He sometimes asked for advice, but once he made up his mind, that was it. He thought that it was better to fight for something, fight really, really hard for it and win it rather than compromise, because if you compromised, you would be giving up some things. For six years, he succeeded by doing it his way. I think of him not in terms of important or unimportant, but in terms of consequential. In addition to talking about great presidents, we need to talk about consequential presidents. What I mean by this is you can be consequential for negative reasons as well as positive reasons, whereas with great presidents, people think you're either great or you're not. So Wilson, if we're talking about consequential presidents, would always be in the top four with Washington, Lincoln, and FDR. Great answer. So when you call Wilson the moralist, what do you mean? I worked on this book for about 10 years, and I didn't have a title for about nine and a half years. And what I was searching for was the word that I thought went deepest into his character. I'm basically a student of character. And so like, what was the one defining trait of Woodrow Wilson? And I think it's his moral preoccupation. It's not that other presidents aren't trying to do the right thing, but Wilson always started with the moral question of what ought we to do? And by ought, he meant from a moral point of view. He came by this from a couple of sources. One, he was a preacher's kid. His father was a Presbyterian minister. But beyond that, he was a student of government and politics and history from the time he was a teenager. Those were his passions. And it's the civic values of the United States that inform his leadership as president. He was always talking about the values of the founding fathers and democracy in particular. He saw democracy as the greatest of all forms of government because government was the consent of the governed, because the United States was the world's most successful democracy. He thought of it as a kind of morally superior nation and an example to the rest of the world, something we should export if other people wanted it. He said in his war address, the world must be made safe for democracy. And it all comes from these civic moral values. Well, he was also one of the few professionals, one of the few studied presidents in history, wasn't he? He certainly was. He's the only one with an earned PhD. A lot of them have honorary PhDs. So he was a real scholar in politics. 
Wilson actually seems like a bundle of contrasting ideas. You know, he campaigns with keep us out of the war and then leads a nation into the war. He wants America to fight for freedom and liberty, but then he nationalizes everything, gags dissent, and attacks freedom of speech. So question is, how do all these contrasting ideas reconcile? You actually can't reconcile them, or at least I couldn't. You just have to accept that there are these contradictions and inconsistencies. With Wilson, no matter whether he's doing something that we can applaud or something that we condemn, it's always from some kind of moral conviction about it. We need more shades of gray in how we think about our leaders. Yeah, he definitely was a man who was trying to do what was necessary. He's trying to do what was necessary. And, you know, having moral convictions kind of can cut both ways. Having moral convictions can turn into moral vanity if you're not careful. Where Wilson got into trouble with his moralism is when he came to a point in his fight for the League of Nations and he saw his opponents, the Republicans, he definitely believed that his ideas of a great amount of American engagement in world affairs, he saw that as a morally superior position. Well, now, this is a man who had a huge effect on the nation. I mean, it was part of the time, but a lot, the man. Could you pick a most remarkable achievement for him? Yes. Uh, I think it's his idea of international engagement, his realization that on planet Earth, we are all in the same boat. He saw the League of Nations as a single alliance. And if you can get the whole world in the same alliance, then collectively you can work together to push back against aggression of some great power that wants to expand. And that was a revolutionary idea. Even though the League of Nations failed, as soon as the United States is in World War II, FDR is pulling together people to create a successor to the League of Nations, and that's how the UN came into being. Well, Professor O'Toole, thank you so much for coming in and giving us these wonderful insights. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Professor Patricia O'Toole is a biographer and professor emerita in the School of the Arts at Columbia University. We have links for you in the podcast notes to learn more about her biographies, including the moralist, Woodrow Wilson, and the world he made. For our updates from the States, this week we head down to Georgia were a passionate citizen historian, author, veteran, and retired police officer, Michael Hitt, has become something of a Georgia in World War I expert. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Theo. So, Michael, to start us off, you mentioned to us that there are two incidents, forgotten incidents in Georgia in World War I. Could you outline them for us? Yes, I'm doing research due to the centennial came across an incident August 8, 1917, just outside Marietta, Georgia, where four civilians were killed while the Army was test firing at the artillery range, and several of their rounds went up over a mountain. They had four three-inch guns set up so they could fire at the south side of Little Kennesaw Mountain and the saddle between it and Big Kennesaw. And now, they thought they were firing at the back end of this mountain chain, and they switched to a high explosive round, but their last salvo went up and over the mountain. And when it came down, it killed four people, two instantly, two died later on, and another gentleman injured. The Army at first had no idea that this incident even occurred. And once they left the area, a reporter caught up with the column to explain what had happened. First, they didn't believe it, but they said, well, okay, we'll send someone there just to check it out. And then they discovered that, oh, my God, people have been killed. And this was the first time these cadet officers had actually fired artillery live. So I used to be in the field artillery in the regular army. And when you change rounds from like a shrapnel to a high explosive, if you don't compensate, that can have a big impact on where that round's going. You've got to readjust the elevation of your weapon. Well, Michael, what was the second incident? The second incident was an Army secret mission called the Gordon Expeditionary Force to Selective Service. We're told by one father, if you make my son join the Army, I'll kill you. And he knew where a large group were just waiting for the government to get him. This group had deserted, taken their weapons with them, banded together for security. The government didn't know how they were going to swing as far as are they going to grab a weapon and shoot it out or just run once they get wind that someone's coming to get them. So when this mission took place morning on the 16th of June, they've got to cross a river called the Etowah River. The first three scout cars got across with no problem. But the first two-ton truck, 
two cross that fell through the bridge, which they discovered later on had been sabotaged. So the truck fell 40 feet, then upside down on top of these men in the river. Three of them were killed, including their medic. And you don't want to lose a medic on something like this. They sent runners looking for somebody with a phone. Constitution reporter, after running a mile, got to a house, which did not have a phone, but at the house was a Mr. and Mrs. Carpenter. And Miss Winnie Carpenter was a trained nurse. So she started administering first aid to the troops. And I found a picture of her in the newspaper and identified, and she's bandaging a soldier at the moment. For what she did that day, the United States gave her an accommodation. She was referred to as an angel of mercy. Well, Michael, excellent. There, there's one more story I wanted to get to very briefly, and that's that you made kind of a shocking discovery when you were looking at a local museum. Could you briefly tell us about that? Well, yes. Yeah, so doing all this research, and again, back to Marietta, Georgia, uh, they have a great museum on the town square, and part of it gets into World War I and how it affected that community. And on display was a three-inch high explosive round it had for many years. And again, having been in the United States, artillery quickly noticed that round has been fired. That round was exactly the same type round that killed these civilians in 1917. And also in 1926, where a nine-year-old found a high explosive round from the artillery range, was playing with it, and it killed him. And I became good friends with the staff there and, and convinced them to just call a bomb squad in, make sure it's inert. So they, they did and quickly discovered the round was live. So for many years, people have been handling the round like, wow, this is, well, it did have some weight behind it, didn't it? And you put it back on a shelf, freestanding, not even behind a glass case. Bomb squad from Cobb County quickly notified Dobbins Air Force Base nearby. And they sent their personnel out. They took the round to a local quarry, packed it with C4 and detonated it. So at least we diverted another possible World War I tragedy. Well, you know, there's similar stories that have come up from the UK and from France. Uh, if you're a museum curator, is there a procedure you should follow with military artifacts just to make sure that they're not actually live? Well, yes, you should call your local bomb squad is what it boils down to. These rounds have to be checked out no matter how old they may seem to people, or you can shake them like, you know, they're old, nothing's going to happen. No, they're still ready to go off. It just takes the right movement to detonate them. Well, we're going to leave the interview on that a uh, uh, little bit of a frightening note. <laughs> Michael, yes. thank you very much for coming by and telling us about Georgia and World War I and some of the incidents there and about the museum. Thank you very much uh, for having me today. Michael Hitt is a citizen historian, author, veteran, and retired police officer of 34 years. Moving to Remembering Veterans. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so we wanted to take a look into the history of PTSD and trauma, both in World War I and after. So with us to help us navigate the topic is Dr. Jason Krauthammel, professor of history at Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan, and co-editor with Peter Lees of the book Psychological Trauma and the Legacy of the First World War. Dr. Krauthammel, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me to be on. Shell shock was coined during World War I. How was it perceived and dealt with during the war? Well, when the war broke out, after a few months of fighting, doctors were quite shocked about the number of men who were displaying various symptoms of what doctors would term shell shock. Uh, by 1915 to 1916, up to 25% of men were showing a variety of symptoms that really confused and stressed out doctors about what the war was doing to human minds and bodies. Men were showing signs of shaking and quivering, they're losing control of their bodies. They're forgetting their own names and what experiences they'd gone through. And doctors assumed that these symptoms were symptoms of organic or biological disturbances. Hence the term shell shock. The idea was that men's bodies and their neurological systems were being shaken by artillery fire, causing bruising and actual biological disorders. That was the pre-war assumption about mental illness that mental illness stemmed from neurological, actual biological disorders that doctors thought were inborn signs of inferiority. And they also believed that men who broke down in this way were what they called hysterical. And that word hysterical uh, was linked to pre-war assumptions that mental illness and hysteria in particular was a female malady, as doctors called it. So they believed that these men were unmanly, that they were not fully able to show their masculine performance and carrying out the masculine duties of warfare. And it was believed that their bodies were somehow inferior, causing them to have these breakdowns. 
that's a pretty stigmatized point of reference. Absolutely. Well, mental illness was a highly stigmatized form of illness. And so men who are labeled in this way were seen as inferior or the term that is oftentimes used in many European medical communities was that they were degenerate, that they are somehow decadent or inferior. But the problem was, is that many of these men who are showing these symptoms did not have pre-war histories of physical or psychological problems. This triggered a debate in the medical community as to whether or not these symptoms were the result of organic inborn disorders or whether or not they were the result of external experiences that men had, in particular, in the stress of the trenches. That debate between whether this was a biological or an experiential phenomenon affected debates also over paths of treatment. The problem was is that these forms of therapy rarely worked, and it caused huge debates in the medical community as to why their approaches and assumptions to mental illness were not working and bringing about treatment. Pre-World War I assumptions about mental illness led to what many of us would consider to be barbaric approaches to, to treating mental illness. You know, I don't want to give just a picture of just the brutality of treatment, what doctors are doing, because there were some doctors who were very empathetic towards these men and who believed that these wounds were not faked and they were not signs of malingering. But there were doctors who did believe these wounds were actually the effects of the psychological stress of combat. I'd be an historian who would argue that World War I was exceptional compared to medieval warfare in long-term mechanized war in which there's less face-to-face killing and more drawn-out suffering under artillery shells, experience being buried alive, I've never seen the enemy, the state of constant fear of death. It's a little bit different than the relatively decisive face-to-face battles in the shorter wars of the medieval period where there'd be traumatic violence, but it would be over within a few days or a few weeks at most. So, jumping off the title of your book, what is the legacy of the First World War when it comes to psychological trauma? That's a great question. Uh, In many ways, one of the legacies of the First World War is the medical profession's realization that normal men, men with no pre-war histories of mental problems, of physical or psychological illness, that normal men break down under the stress of war. By World War II, for example, American doctors realized that after 30 days of being under, you know, shell and artillery fire and machine gun fire at the front, any normal individual is going to break down. I think one of the most important legacies is greater empathy for people who are mentally disabled, especially those who are psychologically injured by war. The stigmatization of people suffering from mental illness still exists, right, into the 20th century and into today, I would say. But in many societies, especially on the political left, a greater call for empathy for these men as real disabled veterans, as authentic victims of war, And that started to lay the groundwork for greater empathy and greater compassion for the mentally ill in general. Dr. Krauthammel, were there any surprises that you found in your research? I think that one thing that is really interesting is that research on psychological trauma in the First World War is starting to shift a little bit where exclusive attention had been focused on doctors and how they've categorized psychological trauma. And the shift in focus has been on patients and how they've perceived these experiences and how they've reacted to being categorized and to being stigmatized. For many men, the the anger and the resentment that they felt in being categorized as malingerers and fakers caused ongoing stress long after the war. Psychiatrists sometimes call this secondary trauma or the primary trauma of the war itself. But there's also the trauma of being neglected or ostracized or stigmatized after the war. There's also a lot of new research that's quite interesting on families coping with loved ones returning home from war, suffering from these kinds of wounds. One of my colleagues, Michael Roper, a sociologist, has interviewed people now in their 90s who were children growing up in the 1920s and 30s who remember their fathers and their loved ones coming home from World War I, and in many cases internalized the wounds of their relatives, people who had been shell-shocked in World War I, but who came home and inflicted domestic violence and bitterness and resentment on their families. And in many cases, their families internalized this kind of a secondary trauma. They internalized those wounds. Right after the war, at the Paris Peace Conference, the France Versailles Treaty, men who suffered from facial wounds from World War I, these grotesque, horrifying physical wounds, were brought with the French delegation to sign the peace treaty. And they're brought in as symbols of what war does to human beings and symbols to try to prevent war from ever happening again. Dr. Krauthammel is a professor of history at Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan. Learn more about him and his numerous books by visiting the link in the podcast notes. We've also included links where you can learn more about PTSD and veterans' health. Welcome to our weekly feature, Speaking World War I, where we explore the words and phrases that are rooted in the war. 
An onomatopoeia is defined as a word that phonetically imitates, resembles, or suggests the sound that it describes, like buzz and hiss. That leads us to our speaking World War I words for this week. Whizbang, crump, and dud. These onomatopoeia, each for a different munition, their nicknames reflecting the noise that they made as they soared through the air towards the trenches. Whizbangs were small, fast-moving shells. Crumps were high explosives. And duds, well, they were duds. Before the war, duds were clothes, and indeed, we sometimes still use that meaning. But during the war, as munitions and artillery earned their nicknames for their sounds and their appearance, the word dud referred to a shell that failed to explode, supposedly derived from the thud sound that the shell would make when it hit the ground. Shells could bury themselves feet deep into the soft, muddy earth of the Western Front if they failed to go off. And as many as one in every three shells fired did not detonate. In the Ypres salient alone, an estimated 300 million projectiles from World War I were duds, and most of them have not yet been recovered. Dud. We hope they stay that way. And it's this week's word for speaking World War I. We have links for you in the podcast notes. Now for World War I war tech. May is bike month. So as the saying goes, they rode into World War I on horses and came out riding tanks and planes. And they were also riding a lot of bicycles. For the combination of speed and efficiency, there isn't much that can beat a modern bicycle. Experiments were carried out in the late 19th century to determine the possible role of bicycles in cycling within the military, primarily because a soldier on a bike can carry more equipment and travel longer distances than a soldier marching. The U.S. Army experimentally mounted infantry on bicycles in 1897 and had them complete a 1,900-mile journey across the plains and the Midwest. The Army's evaluation found that the bicycle lacked the ability to carry heavier weapons. It could not replace the horse's ability to carry heavier artillery broken down into pack loads. And so for the U.S. military, bicycle units were not promoted. However, despite not having a bike-mounted infantry, the United States took a large number, perhaps over 20,000 bicycles to Europe with the American Expeditionary Force, the AEF. The Signal Corps used bikes to deliver messenger pigeons to units and to monitor telephone and telegraph lines. By 1918, each unit had some 40 bikes at their disposal, mostly used to transmit messages. The military police also used bicycles, patrolling roads and managing traffic control stations behind the front. Many of the European military bike-mounted groups wielded foldable bikes that they could carry on their backs to cross more difficult terrain. The bikes even came in handy for a more modern use. They could be turned into manpower generators, bringing electricity to the trenches. Bikes did not, however, make or break military power during the war. They had many uses, but could not give an army an advantage the way tanks and planes and flamethrowers and artillery could. Many of the proposed uses for bicycles, carrying machine guns, transporting the wounded, scouting the front lines, were actually impractical given the realities of trench warfare. The bike at the front also proved an outlet for fun and distraction. Motorcycle and Bicycle Illustrated, a contemporary magazine, frequently reported on bike antics in the AEF. Their March 1919 issue reported that the first AEF bicycle race occurred on George Washington's birthday, February 22, 1919, in France. The winner was announced as Private van der Meeren, a Belgian immigrant and a former Belgian champion cyclist. Bicycles this week's World War I War Tech. Check out the link in the podcast notes to learn more and to see some really interesting images of bike-mounted infantry in action. For articles and posts, here are some of the highlights from our weekly dispatch newsletter. Headline, The New Yorker magazine interviews Sabin Howard about the National World War I Memorial at Pershing Park in Washington, D.C. 
The New Yorker magazine travels to Sabin Howard's Tribeca studio to see the sculptural maquette and to get the inside story on the creative process for the National World War I Memorial at Pershing Park. Headline. Pennsylvania World War I Symposium at U.S. Army History and Education Center. Read about a recent World War I Symposium in Pennsylvania, which the Commission's volunteer coordinator, Betsy Anderson, attended. Headline. Proceedings due soon from Lafayette U.S. Voila! Academic Conference in Paris. The French Society of Cincinnati and the Sorbonne University organized an international history conference called Lafayette U.S. Voila! The American Engagement in France, 1917 to 1918. Now, it was held back in November 2017 in Paris. The conference proceedings are soon to be published, and you can read more about them in this article. Headline, Fred Myers, Our Featured Story of Service. Read more about Fred Myers, a farmer from South Dakota who served on the Western Front 100 years ago this month. Finally, our selection from our official online Centennial merchandise store. This week, it's our canvas and leather tote. You can show your American pride while carrying this unique, made-in-the-USA dark khaki tote. There's plenty of room for keys, wallets, tablets, and documents. And those are some of the headlines this week from the Dispatch Newsletter. Subscribe to the newsletter by going to www.cc.org slash subscribe or follow the link in the podcast notes. And that brings us to the buzz, the centennial of World War I this week in social media with Catherine Akey. Catherine, what are your picks? Hi, Teo. Just two short announcements this week. First off, the PBS special, The Great War, is going to re-air. So if you missed it when it first came out last year, or if you're like me and you just like re-watching good documentaries, you're in luck. The three-part series will come back to PBS stations everywhere on June 19th. The show can also be streamed online if you're a subscribed member to your local PBS station, and you can visit the show's website in the podcast links to watch hours of supplemental free content. Second and last for the week, the USPS, the United States Postal Service, has put out a preview of its upcoming specialty stamps for 2018, including a special World War I commemorative stamp. This forever stamp shows a doughboy gripping the American flag as barbed wire and biplanes loom over his shoulder. The stamp is called Turning the Tide and pays tribute to the sacrifice of American soldiers and the millions of supporters on the home front during World War I. Other 2018 stamps include pioneering astronaut Sally Ride, everyone's favorite neighbor Mr. Rogers, and a showcase of bioluminescent life, among others. Check them all out by following the link in the podcast notes. And that's it this week in The Buzz. And that wraps up this week in May for World War I Centennial News. Thank you for listening. We also want to thank our guests, Mike Schuster, curator for the Great War Project blog, Dr. Edward Langle, military historian and author, Patricia O'Toole, biographer and professor emerita in the School of the Arts at Columbia University. Michael Hitt, citizen historian, author, veteran, and retired police officer. Dr. Jason Krauthammel, professor of history at Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan. Catherine Akey, World War I photography specialist and line producer for the podcast. Many thanks to Matt Nelson, our sound editor, and to Eric Marr for his great input and research assistance. And I'm Teo Mayer, your host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I, including this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago into today's classrooms. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's national World War I memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation for their support. The podcast can be found on our website at www.cc.org slash cn. That's Charlie Nancy. Now with our new interactive transcript feature, 
for students, teachers, bloggers, reporters, and writers. You can also access the World War I Centennial News Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Podbean, Stitcher Radio On Demand, Spotify, using your smart speaker by saying Play WW1 Centennial News Podcast, and now also available on YouTube. Just search for our WW1 Centennial YouTube channel. Our Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC, and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us, and don't forget to share the stories that you're hearing here today about the war that changed the world. Nine, nine, all in nine. All right, boys, now take it slow. Are you ready? Eddie, very good, Eddie. Over the top, let's go. Fly it, fly it, else it's caught a riot. Keep your proper distance, follow along. Hubba, mother, and when you see me hover, obey my orders and you won't go wrong. There's a minute bus a-coming, look out, hear that roar. There's one more, and fast, but there's a very light. Don't gasp for the find you all right. Don't start the bumming with those hand grenades. There's a machine gun, the holy space. Alert, gas, put on your mask. Adjust it correctly and hurry up fast. Drop, there's a rocket for the fight barrage. Down on the ground, push your hand, don't stand. Creep and crawl, follow me, that's all. What do you hear? Nothing near, don't fear, all clear. That's the life of a soul when you take a patrol. Out in no man's land, ain't it grand? Out in no man's land. Ah, no closing joke this week, but a puzzle. What do you think the plural is for onomatopoeia? I've got three onomata whatses. I actually had to go look it up and was surprised by the answer. <laughs> so long. <laughs>